page 112. Chapter 15 Christy Ross was in a hurry to get home after choir that afternoon. Ben had disappeared from school halfway through the day, and she had a feeling she knew why. When she got home, she found her husband hunched over a book on Nazi youth. "'What happened to you today?' she asked. Without looking up from his book, Ben answered irritably, "'I left early. I uh, wasn't feeling well. But I need to be alone now, Chris. I have to be prepared for tomorrow.' "'But, honey, I need to talk to you,' Christy implored. "'Can't it wait?' Ben snapped. "'I've got to finish this before class tomorrow.' "'No,' Christy insisted. "'That's what I have to talk to you about. "'This wave thing. "'Have you any idea what's going on at school, Ben? "'I mean, let's not even dwell on the fact "'that half my class has been skipping just to go to yours.' "'Page 113. "'Do you realize that this wave of yours "'is disrupting the entire school?' At least three teachers stopped me in the hall today to ask what the hell you're up to, and they're complaining to the principal, too. I know, I know, and that's because they just don't understand what I'm trying to do, Ben answered. Are you serious, Ben? his wife asked. Did you know that the school counselors have begun questioning students in your class? his wife asked. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Because, frankly, no one else in school thinks you do. Don't you think I know that? Ben replied. I know what they're saying about me, that I'm crazy with power, that I'm on an ego trip. Have you thought that they may be right? Christy asked. I mean, think of your original goals. Are they still the same ones you have now? Ben ran his hands through his hair. He already had enough problems with the wave. Christy, I thought you were on my side. But inside he knew that she was right. I am on your side, Ben, his wife answered. But I've seen you these last few days, and it's like I don't even know you. You've become so involved in playing this role at school that you're starting to slip into it at home. I've seen you go overboard like this before, Ben. Now you've got to turn it off, honey. I know. It must look to you like I've gone too far. But I can't stop now. He shook his head wearily. Not yet. Then when? Christy asked angrily. After you or some of these kids do something you'll all regret? Page 114. Do you think I'm not aware of that? Ben asked. Do you think it doesn't worry me? But I created this experiment, and they went along. If I stop now, they'll all be left hanging. They'd be confused, and they wouldn't have learned anything. Well, let them be confused, Christy said. Ben suddenly jumped to his feet in frustrated anger. No, I won't do that. I can't do that, he shouted at his wife. I'm their teacher. I was responsible for getting them into this. I admit that maybe I did let this go too long, but they've come too far to just drop it now. I have to push them until they get the point. I might be teaching these kids the most important lesson of their lives. Christy was not impressed. Well, I just hope Principal Owens agrees with you, Ben, she told him because he caught me as I was leaving today and said he'd been looking for you all day. He wants to see you first thing tomorrow morning. The grapevine staff stayed late after school that day to celebrate their victory. The issue on the wave had been so successful that it was almost impossible to find an extra copy anywhere. Not only that, but teachers and administrators and even some students had been stopping them all day and thanking them for revealing the other side of the wave. Already they had heard stories that some students were resigning from the wave. The staff had realized that a single issue of the paper was not enough to stop a movement that had gained as much momentum as the wave had that past week, but at least they had struck it a serious blow. Carl said he doubted there would be any more incidents of threats against non-wave members or any more beatings. Page 115. As usual, Laurie was the last one to leave the publication's office. One thing about the Grapevine staff, they were great partiers, but when it came time to clean up, somehow they all disappeared. It had come as a shock to Laurie earlier that year when she realized what having the top position on the paper, editor-in-chief, really meant. Having to do every little stupid job no one else wanted to do. And tonight that meant cleaning up after the rest of the staff went home. By the time she finished, Laurie realized that it had already grown dark out, 
and she was practically alone in the school building. As she closed the door of the grapevine office and turned off the light, that nervousness she'd felt all week began to return again. The wave was undoubtedly smarting from the wounds the grapevine had inflicted, but it was still strong and Gordon high, and Laurie was aware that as the head of the paper, she... No, she told herself. You're just being silly and paranoid. The wave was nothing serious, just a classroom experiment that had gotten slightly out of hand. There was nothing to be afraid of. The corridors were darkened now as Laurie headed to her locker to drop off a book she would not need that evening. The silence of the empty school was eerie. For the first time she heard sounds she'd never heard before, the hums and buzzes of electrical current running to and from alarms and smoke detectors, a bubbling, splashing sound coming from the science room where some overnight experiment must have been left brewing, even the unusually loud, hollow echo of her own shoes as they wrapped the hard corridor floors. Page 116. A few feet from her locker, Lori froze. There on her locker door, the word enemy was painted in red letters. Suddenly the loudest noise in the corridor was the quick, insistent beating of her own heart. Calm down, she told herself. Someone is just trying to scare you. She tried to get control of herself and started to do the combination of her lock, but she stopped in mid-turn. Had she heard something? Footsteps? Lori backed slowly away from her locker, gradually losing her battle to suppress her own growing fright. She turned and started walking down the hallway towards the exit. The sound of footsteps seemed to be growing louder, and Lori quickened her pace. The footsteps grew even louder, and all at once the lights at the far end of the hall went out. Terrified, Lori turned and peered back down into the dark hallway. Was that someone? Was there someone down there? The next thing Lori knew, she was running down the hallway toward the exit doors at the end. It seemed to take forever to get there, and when she finally reached the double metal doors and banged her hip against the opening bar, they were locked. In a panic, Lori threw herself against the next set of doors. Miraculously, they opened, and she flew out into the cool evening air, running and running. It seemed as if she ran for a long time, and finally she lost her breath and had to slow down, clutching her books to her breast and breathing hard. She felt safer now. Page 117. David sat waiting in the passenger seat of Brian's van. They were parked near the all-night tennis courts because David knew that when Laurie came home from school after dark, she always took this route, where the bright lights from the courts made her feel safe. For almost an hour now, they had been sitting in the van. Brian was in the driver's seat, keeping his eye on the side-view mirror, watching for Laurie and whistling some song so out of tune that David had no idea what it was. David watched the tennis players and listened to the monotonous plunk-ka-plunk of tennis balls being hit back and forth. Brian, can I ask you a question? David said after a long while. What? What are you whistling? Brian seemed surprised. Take me out to the ball game, he said. Then he whistled a few more bars. Coming from his lips, the song seemed completely unrecognizable. There, now can you tell? David nodded. Sure, Brian, sure. He went back to watching the tennis players. A moment later, Brian sat up in his seat. Hey, here she comes. David turned and looked down the block. Lori was coming down the sidewalk, walking quickly. He reached for the door handle. Okay, now just let me take care of this alone, he said, pulling the handle. Just as long as she understands, Brian said. We're not playing around anymore. Sure, Brian, David said, and got out of the van. Now Brian was starting to sound like Robert, too. He had to jog to catch up with her, all the while uncertain of how he should handle this. All he knew was that it was better that he do it than Brian. Page 118. He reached her, but Laurie did not stop, and he had to walk quickly to keep up with her. Hey, Laurie, can't you wait up, he asked. I've got to talk to you. It's real important. Laurie slowed down and glanced behind him. It's okay. Nobody else is coming, David said. Laurie stopped. 
David noticed she was breathing hard and clutching her books tightly. Well, David, she said, I'm not used to seeing you alone. Where are your troops? David knew he had to ignore her antagonistic remarks and try to reason with her. Look, Lori, will you just listen to me for a minute, please? But Lori didn't seem interested. David, we said everything we had to say to each other the other day. I don't want to rehash it now, so just leave me alone. Against his will, David felt himself getting mad. She wouldn't even listen. Laura, you've got to stop writing stuff against the wave. You're causing all kinds of problems. The wave is causing the problems, David. It is not, David insisted. Look, Laurie, we want you with us, not against us. Laurie shook her head. Well, count me out. I told you, I quit. This is not a game anymore. People have been hurt. She started to walk away, but David followed her. That was an accident, he insisted. Some guys just used the wave as an excuse for beating that kid up. Don't you see? The wave is still for the good of the whole. Why can't you see that, Lori? It could be a whole new system. We could make it work. Page 119. Not with me, you can't. David knew if he didn't stop her, she'd get away. It just wasn't fair that one person could ruin it for everyone else. He had to convince her. He had to. The next thing he knew, he had grabbed her arm. Let go of me! Lori struggled to get free, but David held her arm tightly. Lori, you've got to stop, he said. It just wasn't fair. David, let go of my arm! Lori, stop writing those articles. Keep your mouth shut about the wave. You're ruining it for everyone else. But Lori kept resisting. I will write, and I will say anything that I want to, and you can't stop me, she yelled at him. Overcome with anger, David grabbed her other arm. Why did she have to be so stubborn? Why couldn't she see how good the wave could be? We can stop you, and we will, he shouted at her. But Lori only struggled harder to get out of his grasp. I hate you, she cried. I hate the wave. I hate all of you. The words struck David like a hard slap in the face. Almost out of control, he screamed, Shut up! and threw her down on the grass. Her books went flying as she fell roughly to the ground. David instantly recoiled in shock at what he had done. Laurie lay still on the ground, and he was filled with fear as he dropped to his knees and put his arms around her. Jeez, Laurie, are you all right? Laurie nodded, but seemed unable to talk as sobs filled her throat. Page 120. David held her tightly. God, I'm sorry, he whispered. He could feel her tremble, and he wondered how on earth he could have done something so stupid. What could have made him want to hurt the girl, the one he really still loved? Laurie pushed herself up slightly and sat sobbing and gasping for breath. David could not believe it. He felt almost as if he were coming out of a trance. What had possessed him these last days that could cause him to do something so stupid? There he'd been, denying that the wave could hurt anyone, and at the same time he'd hurt Laurie, his own girlfriend, in the name of the wave. It was crazy, but David knew that he'd been wrong. Anything that could make him do what he'd just done was wrong. It had to be. Meanwhile, moving slowly down the street, Brian's van passed them, and disappeared into the darkness. Later that night, Christy Ross went into the study where her husband was working. Ben, she said firmly, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I've been thinking, and I have something important to say. Ben leaned back in his chair and looked at his wife uneasily. Ben, you've got to end the wave tomorrow, Christy told him. I know how much this means to you, and how important you think it is for your students, but I'm telling you, it must end. How can you say that? Ben asked. Because, Ben, if you don't end it, I am convinced Principal Owens will, she told him, and if he has to end it, I promise you your experiment will be a failure. I've been thinking all evening about what you've been trying to accomplish, Ben, and I think I'm beginning to understand. Page 121. But did you ever consider, back when you began this experiment, what might happen if it didn't work? Did it ever occur to you that you're risking your reputation as a teacher? If this goes wrong, 
Do you think parents are going to let their kids into your classroom again? Don't you think you're exaggerating? Ben asked. No, Christy replied. Did it ever occur to you that you've not only put yourself into jeopardy, but me as well? Some people think that just because I'm your wife, that somehow I'm involved in this wave idiocy, too. Does that seem fair, Ben? It breaks my heart that after two years at Gordon High, you're in danger of ruining your job. You're going to end it tomorrow, Ben. You're going to go into Principal Owens and tell him that it's over. Christy, how can you tell me what to do? Ben asked. How can I possibly end it in one day and still do the students justice? You have to think of something, Ben, Christy insisted. You just have to. Ben rubbed his forehead and thought about the next morning's meeting with Principal Owens. Owens was a good man and open to new ideas and experiments, but now he had immense pressures on him. On one side, parents and teachers were in arms over the wave, and pressure was growing on the principal to step in and put a halt to it. On the other side, there was only Ben Ross, pleading with him not to interfere, trying to explain that to stop the wave abruptly could be a disaster for the students. So much effort had gone into it. To end the wave without explanation would be like reading the first half of a novel and not finishing it. Page 122 but Christie was right. Ben knew the wave had to end. The important thing wasn't when it ended, but how. The students had to end it themselves, and they had to understand why. Otherwise, the lesson, the pain, all that had gone into it was for nothing. Christie, Ben said, I know it should end, but I just don't see how. His wife sighed wearily. Are you saying that you're going to go into Principal Owens's office tomorrow morning and tell him that? That you know it should end, but you don't know how? Ben, you're supposed to be the wave's leader. You're the one they're supposed to follow blindly. Ben did not appreciate the sarcasm in his wife's voice, but again he knew she was right. The students in the wave had made him more of a leader than he had ever wished to be, but it was also true that he had not resisted. In fact, he had to admit that before the experiment had gone bad, he had enjoyed those fleeting moments of power. A crowded room full of students obeying his commands, the wave symbol he'd created posted all over the school, even a bodyguard. He had read that power could be seductive, and now he had experienced it. Ben ran his hand through his hair. The members of the wave were not the only ones who had to learn the lesson power taught, their teacher did as well. Page 123. Ben, Christy said. Yes, I know. I'm thinking, he replied. Wondering was more like it. Suppose there was something he could do tomorrow. Suppose he did something abrupt and final. Would they follow him? At once, Ben understood what he had to do. Okay, Christy, I've got an idea. His wife looked at him uncertainly. Something you're sure will work? Ben shook his head. No, but I hope it will, he said. Christy nodded and looked at her watch. It was late, and she was tired. She leaned over her husband and kissed him on the forehead. The skin was damp with perspiration. You coming to bed? Soon, he said. After Christy went into the bedroom, Ben went over his plan again in his mind. It seemed sound, and he stood up, determined to get some sleep. He was just shutting off the lights when the doorbell rang. Rubbing his eyes with weariness, Ross trudged to the front door. Who is it? It's David Collins and Laurie Saunders, Mr. Ross. Surprised, Ben pulled the door open. What are you doing here, he asked. It's late. Mr. Ross, we've got to talk to you, David said. It's real important. Well, come in and sit down, Ben said. As David and Laurie entered the living room, Ben could see that both of them were shaken up. Had something even worse happened because of the wave? God forbid. The two students sat down on the couch. David leaned forward. Mr. Ross, you've got to help us, he said, his voice filled with agitation. What is it? Ben asked. What's wrong? It's the wave, David said. Page 124. Mr. Ross, said Laurie, we know how important this is to you, but it's just gone too far. Before Ross could even respond, David added, 
It's taken over, Mr. Ross. You can't say anything against it. People are afraid to. The kids at school are scared, Laurie told him. They're really scared. Not only to say anything against the wave, but of what might happen to them if they don't go along with it. Ben nodded. In a way, what these students were telling him relieved him of part of his concern about the wave. If he did as Christie told him, and thought back to the original goals of the experiment, then the fears Laurie and David spoke of confirmed that the wave was a success. After all, the wave had originally been conceived as a way to show these kids what life in Nazi Germany might have been like. Apparently, in terms of fear and forced compliance, it had been an overwhelming success. Too much of a success. You can't even have a conversation without wondering who's listening, Laurie told him. Ben could only nod again. He recalled those students in his own history classes who had condemned the Jews for not taking the Nazi threat seriously, for not fleeing their homes and ghettos when rumors of the concentration camps and gas chambers first filtered back to them. Of course, Ross thought, how could any rational person believe such a thing? And who could have believed that a nice bunch of high school students like those at Gordon High could have become a fascist group called the Wave? Was it a weakness of man that made him want to ignore the darker side of his fellow human beings? Page 125. David yanked him from his thoughts. Tonight I almost hurt Laurie because of the wave, he said. I don't know what came over me, but I do know that it's the same thing that's come over almost everyone who's in the wave. You've got to stop it, Laurie urged him. I know, Ben said. I will. What are you going to do, Mr. Ross? David asked. Ben knew he could not reveal his plan to Laurie and David. It was essential that the members of the wave decide the matter for themselves, and for the experiment to be a true success, Ben could only present them with the evidence. If David or Laurie went to school the next day and told the students that Mr. Ross planned to end the wave, the students would be biased. They might end it without really understanding why it had to end. Or worse, they might try and fight him, keeping the wave alive, despite its obvious destiny. David, Laurie, he said, you have discovered for yourselves what the other members of the wave have not yet learned. I promise you that tomorrow I will try to help them toward that discovery. But I have to do it my way, and I can only ask that you trust me. Can you do that? David and Laurie nodded uncertainly as Ben rose and showed them to the door. Come on, it's too late for you kids to be out, he told them. As they went through the door, however, Ben had another thought. Listen, do either of you know two students who have never been involved in the wave? Two students who wave members don't know and wouldn't miss. Page 126. David considered for a moment. Amazing as it might be, almost everyone he knew in school had become a member of the wave. But Laurie thought of two people. Alex Cooper and Carl Block, she said. They're on the grapevine staff. Okay, Ben told them. Now I want both of you to go back to class tomorrow and act as if everything is fine. Pretend we haven't talked, and don't tell anyone that you were here tonight or that you spoke to me. Can you do that? David nodded, but Laurie looked concerned. I don't know, Mr. Ross. But Ben cut her short. Laurie, it is extremely important that we do it this way. You must trust me, okay? Reluctantly, Laurie agreed. Ben bade them goodbye, and she and David stepped into the dark.